guys all have a highlight sheet in your binders that kind of goes over some of this. Not all of it's in here. If uh, you are planning on going through this, this will save you two hours of ground with your instructor later when you have to go back through this. So if you want to get one of these now, uh, it's a good good thing because so you can go through and highlight every little piece that you need to know and then you can go back and tab it out later. If not, you can just write notes and go back on your own later as well. Um, you can use this on your check ride with the examiner. You cannot flip open every question and find the answer. You can use it as kind of a crutch if you don't remember something. You can say, you know what, I don't know what Tomato Flames is, but I know where to find it. Um, so it's nice to have on hand. So the first section we're going to go over is part 43, and some of these might not be in your highlight sheet, so just bear with me. Um, there's a section under part 43, which uh, has to do with major alterations, major repairs, and preventative maintenance. Under section C, it talks about preventative maintenance. Uh, preventative maintenance is limited to the following work, provided it does not involve complex assembly operations. Uh, and the first half of this book is the FAR, so it's Federal Aviation Regulations. The second half is the AIM. We're going to cruise through the first half of the FAR, and then we'll go over a little bit of the AIM. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here you don't need. That's why it's so thick. And it's written by lawyers and the FAA. So I'm not a lawyer, but I'll help you navigate it and leave some of it up to your interpretation. Uh, as a private pilot, you can remove, install, and repair landing gear tires, replace elastic shock absorber cords on the landing gear, service landing gear shock struts by adding oil, air, or both. Uh, you can grease wheel bearings. You can replace defective safety wiring. You can do your own oil changes. Uh, anything that's not a major alteration uh, and is more of a preventative, you can do as a private pilot, not as a student pilot. A major alteration is under the first part of Appendix A to Part 43. Uh, talks about wings, tail surfaces, fuselage, engine mounts, control system. So you can't go out in the hangar and pull your propeller off and send it out for overhaul and put it back. Uh, but you can do your own oil changes. As a student pilot, you can't. That's really all you need to know on the maintenance part 43 side. Then we'll jump ahead to part 61. Uh, these are the kind of sections we're going to focus on are part 61 to 91. 61 has to do with certification. So this is the requirements of getting your pilot certificate, um, kind of the rules that you will go by for getting them, how to get your medical certificate, how to do the written test. Uh, so I'm just going to go through these. So we will go to uh, 61.2 um, validity. No person may exercise privileges of a certificate rating endorsement or authorization issued under this part if the certificate rating or authorization is surrendered, is suspended, revoked, or expired. And then it goes through a big list of other things. Um, you are required to have a medical certificate. You probably went over that briefly in the beginning. Uh, in a second here, we'll jump ahead to talk about those. Uh, 61.5 talks about certificates and ratings issued under this part. There's a bunch of different ones. There's uh, student pilot, sport pilot, recreational pilot, private pilot, commercial pilot, airline transport pilot. Um, and then there's category aircraft ratings, airplane, rotorcraft, glider. And then you have airplane class ratings, and this is going to be on your written test. Uh, like an airplane class would be single engine C, multi engine land, uh, and those types of things. Uh, expired pilot certificates, your, that's 6111, your pilot certificate never expires. Uh, every two years you have to do what's called a flight review. Uh, back in the day, I guess they did <coughs> issue an expiration date, uh, but that was like 1945 or something. 6115, offenses involving alcohol or drugs. A conviction for the violation of any federal or state statute relating to the growing, processing, manufacture, sale, disposition, possession, transportation, or importation of narcotic drugs, marijuana, or depressant or stimulant drugs or substances is grounds for denial of an application for any certificate rating or authorization issued under this part for a period of up to one year after the final date of conviction. Uh, we had a guy maybe four years ago, who was, he went through all of his training and got, and he was ready for his check ride and he went to submit his application. And the first thing it says on your final check ride application, have you ever been convicted of a DUI? 
Uh, and so he checked yes, and it denied his application, and he couldn't keep going. So, uh, offenses involving alcohol or drugs are a big deal, especially if it's been within the last year. Uh, it also comes into play with your medical. Uh, 6116 talks about refusal to submit to an alcohol test. Uh, if you refuse to submit to an alcohol test, you're pretty much denying your certificate. Uh, so they can revoke it or suspend it for any, any reason if you deny uh, or if you have any offenses that involve alcohol or drugs. 6117, temporary certificate. After you pass your check ride, you get a temporary certificate. It's just a piece of paper they print off the printer. It's good for 120 days. After the 120 days, it's no longer valid. Uh, it usually doesn't take that long to get your actual certificate. It usually takes three to four weeks, depending on how busy the FAA is. Uh, and so if that 120 days goes by, you need to contact the FAA to get a new temporary certificate and ask them where your other certificate is. Uh, 6119, duration of pilot and instructor certificates. This, once again, does not really have an expiration date. Flight instructors have to renew their flight instructor certificates every two years. Uh, they can renew it off of activity. So if a flight instructor has a certain amount of sign-offs every year for check rides, that shows that they're actively instructing and they can bypass it. And students, your certificate, uh, once you get a medical that has your student pilot certificate on the back, that is good for the duration of your medical. Uh, so once your medical duration expires, then your student pilot certificate goes away as well. Uh, medical certification. Uh, if you go to, there's a chart under 6123, and it says medical certificates requirement and duration. Uh, this breaks down the list of all the different medical certificates and how long they're good for. So if you're over age 40, your third class medical is good for two years. If you are under age 40, your third class medical is good for five years. Anybody who's flying for fun or just leisure uh, or business uh, and you have your own airplane or you're renting, you just need a third class. Uh, first class is for airline transport pilots or captains, usually at charter companies. Uh, and then there's a second class medical as well, and that's also for charter. Uh, and the way that breaks down is a first class you need uh, once every year if you're under 40 and every six months if you're over 40. So all the airline pilots who are flying around, they have to get a medical every six months uh, who are captains. And then those who are first officers get one every year if they're under 40. Uh, and then it actually reverts. So if you have a first class medical, you can go get a first class medical, you use the privileges, like I'm under 40, so I could use first class medical privileges. And then after one year, it would revert to a second class for one year, and then it would revert to a third class for three years. So somebody might say, what kind of medical do you have? And I would always say first class, but I'm exercising the privileges of a third class medical. Uh, is that important if you're going career? It might matter, but otherwise, uh, the requirements get higher as you go. So if you want a first class medical, some of the testing is a little more invasive. Uh, but for what you guys are doing, third class is plenty fine. 6125, change of name. Uh, probably affects the ladies more. Uh, if you change your name, uh, you need to send in a copy of your marriage license as well as your certificate uh, or a court order or any other document if you want to change your name, uh, just so they have it. 6127 talks about voluntary surrender or exchange of a certificate. If for some reason you never wanted to fly again, you could give them your certificate and they would cancel it. Uh, 6129, I had this happen to me. Replacement of a lost or destroyed airman or medical certificate or knowledge test report. If you lose your written test after you take it, maybe you move or your dog eats it or burns in a fire, uh, the only way to get it back is by sending a letter to the Department of Transportation, FA, Airman Certification Branch, and it lists the address in your <coughs> PO Box 25082. And then uh, it must be accompanied by a check or money order for the appropriate fee. And uh, it kind of goes through some of the other stuff. If you ever forget your medical while you're going to go flying, uh, you have to have your medical on you. Uh, there is a way to go on the FAA website and actually pull up a copy uh, of your certificates. It's kind of like a temporary temporary copy that you can use until you get hard copies. Uh, if you Google it, it'll show up. 
Uh, 6131, type rating requirements, additional training and authorization requirements. Uh, a type rating is for any airplane over 12,500 pounds or turbine, uh, turbojet, I should say. Um, that is specific aircraft training from uh, a certified simulator center and they go through systems and a lot more deeper stuff because the airplanes are more complex. But for us, uh, we can fly, if we're going for airplane single engine land, uh, we can fly any single engine land airplane. But <coughs> there might be something that you want to do later, like you might want to add a tailwheel endorsement so you can fly a tailwheel. You might want to fly something called high performance, which is any single engine over 200 horsepower. So to get those additional endorsements, you need to look inside the FAR under 6131 and see what is required uh, for some of these additional training. So if you want to get an endorsement so you can fly an airplane over 200 horsepower, you need to receive and log ground and flight training from an authorized instructor in a high-performance airplane. Uh, receive a one-time endorsement in the pilot's logbook from an authorized instructor who certifies the person is proficient to operate a high-performance airplane, and it kind of goes through the rest. So there's other things you can do, but just know that you have to go in here and figure out what exactly is needed if you want to add some things to your license. Uh, 6135, knowledge test. This has to do with the written test. Uh, if you're going to go take the written test, you need an endorsement to go take it. You can't just walk in there and take the test. Uh, in the back of your logbook, uh, there's a bunch of endorsement pages, and that will be where you actually get the endorsement. When you are done with the ground school, whenever you're ready to take the test, just call us or come in, and we'll give you the endorsement. Uh, or if you already have a logbook, we'll just endorse you right off the bat. Uh, 6137, knowledge test cheating or other unauthorized contact, uh, conduct. The knowledge tests are filmed. There are cameras in there. You can't bring anything with you, cell phone, etc. Uh, if you cheat, uh, you will suffer the consequences. So don't cheat. Uh, essentially, you get denied for a year after your written test and whatever else they'd like to subject you to. Um, 6139 prerequisites for practical tests. Uh, so when you go to actually take your final check ride for your license, you need to meet all of these uh, different areas. So it says you must pass the required knowledge test within the 24 calendar month period. So the knowledge test, you have two years to uh, take your actual check ride. Uh, you need to present the knowledge test report. You need to hold at least a third class medical, meet the prescribed age requirements, have an endorsement in your logbook uh, that you have received in log training time within the last two calendar months, uh, prepare for the practical test, and demonstrated satisfactory knowledge of the subject areas in which you were deficient. Uh, let's see what else. 6151 pilot logbooks. Uh, you need to have a logbook uh, to keep track of your flight time to show that you meet the uh, experience for the certificate. So you actually don't need a log logbook. You could use a napkin. You could use a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be an official logbook. There's no such thing as an FA approved logbook. Uh, but you always have to log, and this is an acronym, it's CRRF. Uh, you always have to log if it's for a certificate. If it's for a rating, instrument rating, uh, if it's for recency, to show your recency for landings, and for a flight review. Other than that, you never have to log it. You could get your license and you could fly by yourself from here on out, never carry passengers, and you'd never have to log anything except for your flight review. Uh, why you do that, I don't know. It's kind of fun to keep track of how many hours you have. So when somebody asks you, do you have to keep a logbook? The answer is no, unless it's for those. Uh, and if you don't keep a logbook, that's nice because the logbooks already lay out like the date, the aircraft, everything. Uh, this actually goes through and tells you that you need to put the date, the total flight time or lesson time, location where the aircraft departed, type of an, an identification of the airplane, if it's solo, if it's pilot in command, yada yada yada. Uh, Logging of solo flight time, this is section D under that same part, except for a student pilot performing the duties of pilot in command of an airship requiring more than one pilot, 
uh, flight crew member, a pilot may log as solo flight time only that flight time when the pilot is the sole occupant of the aircraft. Uh, and I made this mistake after I got my license. I kept logging all my stuff as solo because I thought I was solo. But uh, the logging of solo time is only required for your private pilot. And the only time you are considered solo are when you are by yourself. You can't be solo with passengers. It's illegal. Uh, and then logging pilot and command time, which is section E. And this is the best time because that means you're, you're the one in charge. Uh, that is when you are the sole manipulator of the controls of an aircraft for which the pilot is rated. Um, so it could be you and a, and a friend in the airplane and your flight time is considered pilot in command because you're the one who's solely manipulating the controls, even though both of you could be pilots. Uh, let's see. Under that same section going down to I, presentation of required documents. Persons must present their pilot certificate, medical certificate, logbook, or any other record required by this part for inspection upon a reasonable request by the administrator, which is the FAA, uh, an authorized representative from the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, or any federal, state, or local law enforcement officer. Uh, at a time I was down in Arizona doing some time building, and we landed at an airport. Uh, that was a public airport, but they had this kind of off area place where they chopped up airplanes. And we didn't know we couldn't go there. And uh, we were walking around looking at 747s and all of these things. And some security guy came out and like demanded that we saw, he saw our certificates and everything. Uh, so if the FAA comes and wants to ramp check you, which is a common occurrence, uh, they will come out every once in a while and just walk out on the ramp and make sure you have all your required documents, certificates with you, kind of like being pulled over by a cop. They're not looking to bust you. Um, logging night vision goggle time. Sounds cool. 6153. Uh, you are prohibited on operating uh, an airplane during a medical deficiency. So if you knowingly have a medical problem, uh, you should not be flying the airplane. Uh, so if you break both of your legs, you shouldn't attempt to go and get into the airplane and fly it. And so what you're supposed to do is essentially self-ground yourself until you are deemed you're fit to fly. Uh, and that kind of brings in this I'm safe checklist. And so how do you know when you're fit to fly? Because some days you might have a headache, some days you might be tired. Uh, and we'll just kind of run down the board. The first one is illness. If you are sick, if you have the flu, if you have a cold, uh, all of that can impair your performance. There's 365 days in a year, there's probably another day you can go flying, so just skip it. Uh, medication. This is a big one that catches a lot of people. Uh, you might be on Tylenol, uh, you might be on Xanax, you might be on Vicodin. There's a lot of different medications out there. Uh, there's a certified list of approved uh, medications. Uh, it's, if you Google like AME uh, certified medications, it'll come with a big list of FA approved medications. Uh, believe it or not, NyQuil has a half-life after it and it's like, I think it's 36 hours or something after you take it, uh, that it still is in effect and you can't fly. Uh, Something nobody would realize. They'd take a night cool, go to sleep, and show up the next day for a flight, and little did you know that uh, that's really affecting your performance. Uh, same thing with allergies. Uh, if you mix Sudafed and Claritin together, you cannot fly. You can have one or the other. Uh, so there's a lot of little things. And the easiest thing is just look online, and if you don't know, uh, call your medical examiner. Uh, we use Philcidel and Edina. You just call them and say, hey, I'm taking whatever it is, and he'll tell you if it's approved or not. Better safe than sorry. Uh, next one is stress. I personally find flying a great stress reliever, uh, but if you're having a really bad day, it's not probably the greatest idea to get into an airplane uh, and fly around angry. Uh, more days to fly. And A, can anybody guess what A would be? Alcohol. If you are drinking, you cannot fly. Same thing with drugs. Uh, you must stop drinking eight hours, bottle to throttle, and you cannot have a BAC over 0 0.04. And if you have a BAC over 0 0.04 after stopping eight hours prior, you are having a great night. Uh, 
So that's the rule. No alcohol impairs your performance. Uh, F is fatigue. And uh, this is a big reason why there's a lot of aviation accidents. Uh, fatigue is highly talked about right now in the uh, airline level. They actually just recently approved a new safety thing for uh, new pilot rest rules. Uh, they found it was a factor in a lot of incidents and crashes. Uh, and the last one is eat. Blood sugar. If you show up for a lesson and you haven't eaten all day, your blood sugar is going to be really low and you're probably not going to feel very good when you go flying. Uh, or vice versa if you're going on a trip somewhere. So if you come here after work or you come here before work, make sure you eat. Uh, I like to eat light before I fly. I don't like to have a giant meal, but you know, bring a granola bar or something with you to keep your blood sugar going. So that's I'm safe. You will get asked that on your check ride. Not too hard to memorize. Uh, let's see. 6156 flight review. Uh, a flight review is what you need every two years to exercise the privileges of pilot and command of an air, aircraft or whatever you're rated for. Uh, a flight review must consist of a minimum of one hour of flight training and one hour of ground training. The review must include a review of the current general operating and flight rules of Part 91 of this chapter and a review of those maneuvers and procedures at the discretion of the person giving the review are necessary for the pilot to demonstrate the safe exercise of the privileges of the pilot certificate. Uh, so it's not really a check ride, but it's more of a competency safety review. Uh, usually you come in, we sit down, I pull out the far aim, we start going through it, we quiz you, make sure you understand everything that you might have forgotten over the last two years. Uh, believe it or not, if you never open this and look at it after two years, some things kind of start fading away. Uh, and then we go out and fly and we just do maneuvers that are at the discretion of whoever's given the flight review. If you go out and fly and maybe your landings aren't good enough, your maneuvers aren't good enough, uh, it's just counted as a dual given. It's not a pass fail. It's a, we're going to give you more dual and we're going to keep flying until you get your competency level up to where we feel you are safe. And that's at the discretion of the flight instructor. Uh, 6157, recent flight experience for a pilot in command. Uh, no person may act as a pilot in command of an aircraft carrying passengers of an aircraft certificated for more than one pilot flight crew member unless that person has made at least three takeoffs and three landings in the last 90 days. So if you are at day 95 and you want to take your friend flying and you haven't done three takeoffs and landings in the last 90 days, you cannot take your friend with you. Uh, so usually what people will do is they'll realize, oh, I'm not current. I'm going to jump out of the airplane. I'm going to do three takeoffs and landings, and then I'm going to pick my friend up, and then we're going to go. Uh, not hard to do three takeoffs and landings in the last 90 days. It's three months. If you did one landing a month, you would make it happen. It would cost you like... 15 bucks a time. Uh, night takeoff and landings, these are different. Night, uh, legal night is considered one hour after sunset and one hour before sunrise. So even though it's dark outside, an hour after sunset is when legal night starts. Uh, this you need to do three takeoffs and landings as well, but they need to be to a full stop. So you actually have to come to a complete stop. Usually we just taxi back, come back around, and take off again. That's to carry people at night. So you have to be day and night current. If you're not night current, you have to go do the same, th same thing if you want to bring somebody with you. Uh, night vision goggles. 6159, falsification, reproduction, or alteration of applications, certificates, logbooks, reports, or records. Why would anybody want to falsify their logbook? Why not? Any idea? No, it's actually, what? Just to build time. Yeah, just to build time. It's actually, uh, hopefully not too of a common thing, but I've <laughs> seen news stories of people who don't even have pilot certificates and flying in Switzerland or uh, wherever. Uh, if you make a fraudulent entry into your logbook that is not true, uh, you will be bo pretty much revoked and banned for life from ever flying again. Uh, the FAA takes that very seriously. Uh, some people do it to try to get ahead for a job, they need to log more time. 
Uh, the biggest thing is just don't do it. Uh, they can go back and they can look at maintenance records of the airplane. Uh, you might put down a tail number of some airplane that is sitting in a hangar somewhere and the FAA goes and looks at it and hasn't flown in 20 years. Uh, so they do follow up on that if something looks suspicious. Uh, 6160 change of address. The holder of a pilot, flight instructor, or ground instructor certificate who has made a change in permanent mailing address may not after 30 days from that date exercise the privileges of the certificate unless you have notified in writing to the FAA certification branch and it gives you the address. Uh, so after day 30, you can no longer be PIC until you notify them of your new address. And it gets into instrument rating requirements if you want to keep going. Military stuff. Uh, subpart C, jumping ahead to 6181. Uh, 61, that 6181 is applicability. 6183 is eligibility requirements to uh, be a student pilot. So to be a student pilot and get a certificate, you need to be at least of 16 years of age. Uh, and you need to be able to read, write, and understand the English language. Uh, then it gets into 6187, talks about solo requirements for student pilots, and talks about pre-solo flight training. If you're curious about what maneuvers you need to do, uh, under 6187D, it talks about all the maneuvers. You need to have proper flight preparation procedures, taxiing on surface, uh, takeoffs and landings, straight and level, climbs, climbing turns. There's a giant list here of all the maneuvers and things you need to be proficient in before you can solo. And then it goes on for all the other ones. And then uh, 6193 uh, talks about solo cross-country flight requirements. Uh, a solo cross-country flight of greater than 25 nautical miles uh, from where the airport originated is considered a solo cross-country. And it goes through a bunch of things. Uh, 6189, jumping back. A student pilot may not act as pilot in command of an aircraft that is carrying a passenger, that is carrying property for compensation or hire, uh, or in furtherance of business. So as a student pilot, you may not really do anything except fly by yourself and build your skills. <clears throat> Keep jumping ahead. Uh, and then... Jumping ahead to subpart E, 61103, private pilots. Talks about eligibility requirements to be a private pilot. You can get a student pilot certificate at 16 in order to pass your check ride and take your check ride. You need to be at least of 17 years of age. Uh, and it goes through all the other requirements as well. Uh, and then it jumps down on the next page, 61107, talks about flight proficiency. And there's a big list right here of all the things you need to be proficient in before you take your check ride, which we train you to proficiency. Uh, and it's a big list. Navigation, uh, takeoffs, landings, airport operations, sole flight, stalls. Talks about cross-country flights for pilots based on small islands, and then we get into 61.123, which gets into commercial pilots. Keep jumping through, and then we get into airline transport pilots, which is airlines. <clears throat> Keep jumping through instructors. Make sure I don't miss anything. So that's part 61. Is everybody clear on kind of how that flows and what uh, what it's there for? Pretty straightforward. Take that as a yes. Uh, part 67 in here talks about medical standards and certification. Uh, this is everything you want to know about uh, what your medical is going to be like. It gives uh, eye requirements, ear, nose, and throat equilibrium, mental requirements, cardiovascular requirements. Uh, so any questions you have there about what they're testing you for uh, is in part 67. Then we jump ahead. We don't really operate under this piece. And we will jump to... This is where it gets more fun. So now we're at part 91, and part 91 is general operating and flight rules. So the first part certification, this is the actual rules that uh, we must follow. 
So we'll start out with 91.3, responsibility and authority of the pilot in command. When you are solo in an airplane or after you have your license and you're the only one that's operating the aircraft, you are the pilot in command. You are responsible for and are the final authority as to the operation of that aircraft. So you're responsible for every single thing that happens. If you do a pre-flight inspection and you do not check the oil and the engine is low on oil and you take off and grenade your engine, that is your fault. If you leave with no fuel and you take off and you lose fuel mid-flight and you put it down in a field somewhere, that is your fault. So you are the final say to everything to do with that aircraft. It's not anybody else's fault. Uh, in an in-flight emergency requiring immediate action, the pilot in command may deviate from any rule of this part to the extent required to meet that emergency. Um, each pilot in command who deviates from a rule under paragraph B of the section shall, upon the request of the administrator, send a written report of that deviation to the administrator. Um, let's see. 91.7, Civil Aircraft Airworthiness. No person may operate a civil aircraft unless it is in airworthy condition. The pilot in command of a civil aircraft is responsible for determining whether the aircraft is in condition for safe, plate, safe flight. The pilot in command shall discontinue the flight when unairworthy mechanical, electrical, or structural conditions occur. If you walk out to the airplane and it is leaking fuel like crazy on the ramp, or the propeller is, has a big chunk missing from it, you are the final authority to say, yes, this plane is safe to go. No, it is not. Um, Ninety-one, eleven. Uh, interference with crew members. No person may assault, threaten, or intimidate, or interfere with a crew member in the performance of the crew member's duties aboard an aircraft being operated. So if you bring your friend with you and they threaten you, assault you, or intimidate you, they are breaking a federal law. Uh, 9113, careless or reckless operation. Believe it or not, this happens all the time. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, people are trying to show off. Uh, aircraft operations for the purpose of air navigation. No person may operate an aircraft in a careless or reckless manner so as to endanger the life or property of another. Uh, what do you think that means? <laughs> Don't buzz your friend's house at 300 feet above their house to get their attention. Don't go flying over the lake at 100 feet to show off to your girlfriend uh, who's on a boat nearby. Uh, there was some guy in Florida who wanted to really land on the beach somewhere and he was asking the controller if he could do it and the controller was like, no, that's you know, it's illegal and sure enough the guy lands on the beach in Florida and uh, uh, somebody was filming it as he flew by because he was so low and got his tail number and the guy probably got his certificate pulled. Uh, so be smart. Uh, don't be reckless. It's pretty obvious what's defined as careless or reckless operation. Uh, 9115, dropping objects. Uh, no pilot in command of a civil aircraft may allow any object to be dropped from that aircraft in flight that creates a hazard to persons or property. However, the section does not prohibit the dropping of any object if reasonable precautions are taken to avoid injury or damage to persons or property. So can you drop things from an airplane? Yeah, you can. Uh, if you take reasonable precautions. So if you want to drop a bowling ball out your window and see if you can hit a target on your on your farm or something. You can do it as long as you make sure reasonable precautions are taken. 9117, alcohol or drugs. No person may act uh, as a crew member of a civil aircraft within eight hours after the consumption of any alcoholic beverage. We just talked about this. Uh, it is also against the FARS to carry somebody who is under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Uh, it, who is intoxicated, I should say, uh, unless it's an emergency. Uh, so if it's an emergency and your friend is hammered, uh, you can fly them, but only if it's an emergency. Uh, 9119, carriage of narcotic drugs, marijuana, depressants, stimulant drugs, etc. Obviously it's illegal, you're transporting drugs across state lines or whatever else you might be doing. Uh, Jump ahead there. 9125, uh, Aviation Safety Reporting Program. Uh, there's something called a NASA form. 
And what this is is a form that you can fill out anonymously to report you breaking a rule or something questionable. Uh, I had to do one a couple years ago for a student who flew over class D airspace unannounced, not talking to anybody. Uh, so it's it's not a get out of jail free card if you blatantly break a rule, but maybe you did something you weren't sure so if somebody saw it or not and you just want to protect yourself. Uh, you can go in and uh, report yourself and then they take your name and number of the application off that, off that sheet of paper and they turn it in and they see what's going on. Uh, last month we had 30, 30 people who uh, flew into the clouds accidentally. You know, as a private pilot, you're not allowed to fly into the clouds. Maybe you were out flying and the weather got bad and you popped into a cloud and you know, it's against the rules. You're a private pilot, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, so that's what that's used for. Um, Use it if you need it. Uh, if you're ever unsure if you need it, use it. Uh, 91103, pre-flight action. Before you go flying, each pilot in command shall, before beginning a flight, become familiar with all the available information concerning that flight. Uh, this means runway links at the airport. This means fuel requirements, alternates, uh, pretty much everything that has to do with the flight beforehand. If the airport's open, you might go and fly somewhere and the airport's not open. You might fly somewhere and the lights don't work at night. Uh, so it's your responsibility to make sure that you're checking NOTAMs and all these other things uh, to make sure that, and a big one is TFRs, temporary flight restrictions. Uh, when the president comes to town, when any other high level official, uh, over the Twin Stadium and Viking Stadium and Gopher Stadium and when they're in season, uh, there's a TFR over the top of the field. You cannot fly directly over it at certain altitudes. Uh, so it's your responsibility to check ahead of time and make sure that you're not about to go fly over the Twin Stadium to show your friends downtown and there's a game going on. Uh, 91105, flight crew members at stations. During takeoff and landing, and while en route, each required flight crew member shall be at the crew member station unless the absence is necessary to perform duties in connection with the operation of the aircraft or in connection with physiological needs. And keep the safety belt fastened while at the crew member station. Um, then we get into 91107, use of seat belts, shoulder harnesses. Uh, essentially all you need to know here is that while you're on takeoff and while you're on landing, you need your seat belts and shoulder harnesses on. Uh, when you are en route, you still need your seat belt on, uh, but you do not need to use a shoulder harness. Uh, honestly, you don't even notice them. They're already there. You might as well just wear it. It saves you from having your head impaled into a attitude indicator or some other instrument. Uh, so it's well worth the, uh, the time to just wear it. It's like wearing your seat belt. Why wouldn't you wear the part that comes across if you have it? Uh, 91 111, operating near other aircraft. No person may operate an aircraft so close to another aircraft as to create a collision hazard. Uh, no person may operate an aircraft in formation flight except by arrangement with the pilot in command of each aircraft in the formation. So you might be flying around, you might recognize somebody from the class, and you think it'd be cool or funny to go fly up next to them. It's a no-no, don't do it. Uh, and you may not operate an aircraft carrying passengers for hire in formation flight. You probably wouldn't enjoy that if you were on your Delta Airlines flight and you were sitting right next to somebody. Uh, 91.113, right of way rules, uh, except water operations. This talks about who has the right of way. Uh, in distress, an aircraft in distress has a right of way over all other traffic. If somebody has an engine failure or has some kind of mechanical problem, you need to get out of the way and let them land before you. Uh, converging aircraft. When aircraft of the same category are converging at approximately the same altitude, uh, not head on, the aircraft to the other's right has the right of way. So whoever's to your right has the right of way when you're coming in. Um, if two aircraft are approaching head-on, uh, each pilot so shall alter your course to the right. So if both of you know to break right, you'll never hit each other. Uh, that's on your written test. Overtaking. Each aircraft that is being overtaken has the right of way, and each pilot of uh, an overtaking aircraft shall alter course to the right to pass well clear. Uh, so if somebody's coming up on you and you're lower, you have the <coughs> right of way. Uh, during landing, Aircraft while on final approach to land or while landing have the right of way. 
uh, over all other aircraft in flight. And then it gets into right of way for water operations. That doesn't affect us. Uh, 91 117 aircraft speed. Uh, believe it or not, there is a speed limit. Our airplanes don't go fast enough to even touch it, but it's important to know. Uh, unless otherwise authorized by the administrator, no person may operate an aircraft below 10,000 feet MSL at an indicated airspeed of more than 250 knots. So 250 knots or less below 10,000 feet. Uh, in a Class D airport or airspace, uh, you may not operate at an indicated speed of more than 200 knots. What's an example of a Class D airport? Here. Here. So flying clouds Class D, so we have a 200 knot limit. Uh, but some airplanes can break that very easily. Uh, and in Class B, which is Minneapolis, some of the bigger airports, Dallas, uh, it's 200 knots. So once you get into Class B, you have to stay below 200. Um, 91, 119, minimum safe altitudes. Uh, anywhere a minimum safe altitude is an altitude allowing if a power unit fails an emergency landing without undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. So yeah, you might be out somewhere flying around at 600 feet just messing around uh, in the 172. Is it the wisest idea? Probably not, uh, because if you do have an engine failure or something of that nature, you don't have any altitude to really recover. Uh, so I always like to keep the altitude up a little bit higher. Uh, over congested areas, over any congested area of a city, town, or settlement, or over any open air assembly of persons, an altitude of 1,000 feet above the highest <laughs> obstacle within a horizontal radius of 2,000 feet of the aircraft. Uh, the definition of congested is right there. Uh, Sometimes the FAA has a different idea of what is congested. Uh, it's really anything where there's houses or you know farms, things like that. It is a congested area. Uh, other than congested areas, you can see how lawyerish this gets. Uh, an altitude of 500 feet above the surface, except over open water or sparsely populated areas. Uh, in those cases, the aircraft may not be operated closer than 500 feet to any person, vessel, vehicle, or structure. So essentially, if you're flying below 500 feet, you're breaking the rules. Um, what's the difference between uh, sparsely populated and populated? How are you going to know the difference? What's an example of sparsely populated? Downtown Minneapolis would be populated, right? And uh, somewhere between Mille Lacs and Bemidji, there's probably not a lot of stuff up there. Uh, it's not going to be as populated. So it'd be sparsely populated. 91125 ATC light signals. Did the tower show you their handy dandy light gun? It's pretty old school. Uh, in 91125, they have a chart in here that shows you all of those light gun signals. You will need to know them for your check ride. Uh, steady green on the surface means you're clear for takeoff. If you're in flight, it means clear to land. Flashing green means you are clear to taxi. Uh, or if you're in flight, return for landing. R steady red means stop if you're on the ground. Uh, in the air, it means give way to other aircraft and continue circling. Circling. Uh, circling. Flashing red equals taxiway clear of runway in use. And then if you're in flight, airport is unsafe, do not land. Flashing white, return to the starting point on the airport, and in flight doesn't mean anything. Alternating red and green means extre exercise extreme caution for both. Um, then we get into 91126, which talks about operating the vicinity of an airport in Class G airspace. Uh, and then we go ahead and that talks about operations in Class D airspace. <coughs> Anybody tell me how far Class D airspace goes out, mileage-wise? 30. Nope, that's Class B. Class D, how far out does it go? Five. Five. Five is correct. Uh, let's see. Should I miss anything here? 
the big part about class G airspace is direction of turns. You might have gone over this in the airspace. Uh, when operating without a control tower in class G airspace, each pilot of an airplane must make all turns of that airplane to the left unless the airport displays approved light signals or visual markings indicating that the turn should be made to the right, in which case all the pilot must make all the turns to the right. Uh, let's see. Uh, noise abatement is under section H under here. Uh, where a formal runway use program has been established by the FAA, each pilot of a large or turbine powered airplane assigned a noise abatement runway by ATC must use that runway. Uh, here at Flying Cloud, we have a noise abatement procedure. We get a lot of complaints because people live near the airport and it's loud. Uh, there's one lady who actually has a radio and listens. I mean, we've gotten a couple noise complaints. It's pretty common, but they'll actually sit there and listen for your tail, tail number at 2 in the morning and say, oh, Cessna so and so is flying at 2 a.m. Uh, and so the noise abatement procedure is to essentially fly neighborly and avoid doing maintenance run-ups late at night. Uh, people live close to here's townhouses and everything. Once you start flying around here, you'll really see it. Uh, but they send us over the river valley and kind of leave and arrive that way just to keep it down for the people who live here. Um, Ninety-one, one thirty-three, restricted and prohibited areas. Uh, you may not operate an aircraft through a prohibited area, right? Did you go through that on the sectional prohibited? Uh, how about a restricted area? Can you fly through that? What do you need? What do you need to fly? Permission. You need permission to fly through a restricted area. Uh, how about Class A airspace? What's our cloud clearance in Class A? Oh. Nope. Somebody's got to know. You can't go there. No. there you go. It's a trick question. <laughs> and it's high enough up that our airplanes don't even make it up there. Uh, uh, 91146, passenger carrying flights for the benefit of a charitable nonprofit or community event. As a private pilot, you cannot take a package for somebody and fly it up to Duluth for 50 bucks. It's just not, not allowed, it's for compensation. Uh, as a private pilot, you are really restricted in anything you can do. However, you can do a flight for a charitable nonprofit or community event. And then it gives you the de definitions. Charitable event means an event that raises funds for the benefit of a charitable organization recognized by the Department of the Treasury, whose donors may deduct contributions under Section 170 of the IRS. Uh, community event means an event that raises funds for the benefit of any local or community cause that is not a charitable event or nonprofit event. Uh, and then it gives nonprofit event. Uh, and it talks about kind of the rules of things you need to do. Uh, so answer is if it's for a charity event, you can fly. Uh, you just aren't doing it for hire. You're flying other people around uh, and they might pay you back for your airplane expenses. Uh, just not you directly for your time. In order to do that for your time, you need to be a commercial pilot. Uh, let's see. 91151, fuel requirements for flight and VFR conditions. This is very important. No person may begin a flight in an airplane under VFR conditions unless there is enough fuel to fly to the first point of intended landing and assuming normal cruising speed during the day to fly after that for at least 30 minutes. And for night, you need to be able to fly after that for at least 45 minutes. Uh, so, if our 172 burns eight gallons an hour, how much fuel do you need to have when you touch down and land back at Flying Cloud? Four gallons. Four gallons. So you, you dip your tanks and you make sure you have four gallons of gas remaining. That is pretty dang low. I would not feel comfortable with four gallons. Uh, and at night, 45 minutes would be like, you know, six gallons. Uh, and even that's pretty low. Uh, always leave with your tanks full unless you absolutely have to take fuel out for weight and balance or something. Uh, even if you're just going around for an hour around here, always leave with them full. We top the planes off after every lesson. It's just easier. You have more fuel available. Why not? 
Uh, if our flight plan information, you'll go over that when we talk about cross-country planning. Uh, 91155, basic VFR weather minimums. There is a chart in here that has all of the weather minimums for airspace. Uh, this is an awesome tool when you are stuttering, studying to get these down uh, because they are hard to remember. Uh, and so if you ever need to reference what the airspace minimums are, this is where it is. Uh, can anybody tell me what uh, Class B airspace distance and flight visibility required is? You look like you know. Me? Yeah. Yeah, just read it. <laughs> three, three, miles, clear clouds. three miles, clear clouds. Class C, it's easy to remember when it's class C, D, and E, less than 10,000. They're all 3152. Uh, then it gets into class G and it gets a little more complicated. Uh, you will go over airspace several times during your training because it's not something that totally clicks on one lesson. How do you know you're entering? The certain airspace? Yeah, you just have to know based on the altitude and where you're at on the chart. So when you're flying around, uh, these are starting to become more old school with iPads now. Uh, since an iPad is much smaller. On my private pilot check ride, I forgot to have this set to where I was going and I had to stretch it out like this in the cockpit to find it and I couldn't see outside. Uh, essentially, as you're flying around, you literally just look on the chart and you say, I think I am right here and I am currently at 3,000 feet, therefore I am in Class E airspace and my cloud clearance is this. As I get out here, I am now in Class G airspace and I am descending and I am below 700 feet now and I need one mile clear clouds. So it's a constant thought process. Honestly, the easiest way to remember it all is just stay away from the clouds. Uh, keep your visibility uh, high and stay away from the clouds. Uh, why do you think in Class E, above 10,000 feet, the uh, visibility clearance goes up to 5? It goes 5111 instead of 3152. What would that be? Faster planes? Yep. Pretty much anything that's going to be going up to 10,000 is moving faster. Therefore, if you're VFR, you're responsible for your collision avoidance. And you need to... Uh, better look out for that. So these are very tedious. If you have an iPad, uh, I don't know if Travis talked about Four Flight. Uh, there's a couple different uh, apps. We actually have a couple guys from Garmin right now that are flying with us who are developers. Uh, and they are testing and modifying the Garmin Pilot app. And uh, it's a lifesaver because you ditch all of these. You pay 75 bucks a year for Four Flight and it has every single chart and every single AFD. Which one you think is better, the AOPA one or the Four Flight one? Four Flight, without a doubt. They they were kind of the first ones into the market, and they've really advanced continuously. They're kind of the innovators of it. Uh, yeah. Can you use a Four Flight or an iPad instead? Of yeah, you can. You can. On, a uh, ride, on your check ride, you can, but it's fair game for the examiner to say your battery just died. Uh, and it actually happened to one of our students, he was doing his instrument check ride and he forgot to charge his iPad and they already took off and he pulls out the iPad and he's at like 8% and then it died in the flight. Uh, so it's good to have backups. Uh, you are not required, these expire, you are not required to have current charts. Uh, you, it's just nice to have so you know where you are. And that's where when you have the iPad it's great because it enhances situational awareness. Because if you get the one that has the GPS chip in it, you can actually see yourself on the sectional chart as you fly around. Uh, and then you can avoid ever flying into Class B and all those other things. So definitely look into, into that. It's cheaper than buying these. These are like, a sectional is like 10 bucks. And they're good for six months. But usually on your training, you're going to need like three or four different areas. Because they only cover that tiny little piece. And then these two, you need AFDs for every little area you're going to. So... Well worth it. Uh, 91157, special VFR weather minimums. You guys talk about this the other night? Special VFR? Uh, special VFR operations may only be conducted with an ATC clearance clear of clouds. Uh, and this is below, it says here, uh, 
Special VFR operations may be conducted under the weather minimums and requirements of the section instead of those contained in 91155. Below 10,000 feet MSL within the airspace contained by the upward extension of lateral boundaries of controlled airspace. So if you're in controlled airspace and it is currently 900 feet overcast and it is two miles visibility, what is the airport VFR? What is the airport go IFR? It goes, air, it goes IFR. It goes IFR under 1,000 foot ceilings and three miles of visibility. Uh, and then anything over that is VFR. It goes marginal VFR, then it goes VFR. Uh, so if it is IFR out, and it happens all the time where it's 900 feet overcast here and it's two miles of visibility, but we go six miles to the west, or 10 miles to the west, and it's clear in a million, we can't leave because it's IFR, right? So, if you have a private pilot certificate, you can request special VFR from the tower. Uh, you have to request it. The tower cannot give it to you. Uh, it's a liability on their standpoint if they say, oh, well, would you like special VFR and you take off and you get lost in the visibility and do something. Uh, I actually had a renter two years ago call me and uh, he was out flying and when he left, the weather didn't look very good, but that was his judgment call. And uh, he was flying around and he called the tower and they said, oh, the airport's now IFR, we can't let you enter your VFR. And he didn't really know what to do, so he called me and he's like, oh, I'm circling this cell phone tower and I can't get into the airport, any ideas? And I was like, oh, why don't you cross special VFR? And he's like, oh, like totally forgot about that because it's a kind of a little tool that you can have in your pocket uh, to get into the airport if the weather starts deteriorating. Uh, the biggest thing is you just got to remain clear of clouds and you have to remember that you have to abide by your minimum safe altitudes. So if it was 400 overcast and a mile and a half visibility, probably not a great idea to, to try it. But if it's, you know, two miles visibility and thousand foot ceilings, sure, why not? Uh, what's, your, uh, what's your recommended minimum visibility for student pilots? For student pilots, you are, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, if you're staying here and like in the pattern, it's six, six plus miles. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to go out and solo, it's 10. Uh, we're very, very uh, restrictive on that. It's just easier to have the best weather. If you go on a cross country, it's 10,000 plus foot ceilings and unlimited visibility. Uh, that way there's no chance that you get caught in some situation that you can't get yourself out of. Uh, the one thing you cannot do with special VFR is do it at night. You need an instrument rating if you want to do special VFR at night. But as a private pilot, you can request special VFR. 91.159, VFR cruising altitudes or flight levels. Uh, there's a lot of traffic out there going back and forth. Uh, more than 3,000 feet above the surface uh, when operating below 18,000 feet. On a magnetic course of 0 through 179, you must be at any odd 1,000 foot altitude plus 500 feet. Does that make sense? So 0 through 179, odd 1,000 foot altitude plus 500. If you are on a magnetic course of 180 degrees through 359 degrees, you must be even 1,000 plus 500 feet. Uh, this makes it nice because that way when you're out flying around, hopefully everybody's following the rules and you have separation between you. That way if somebody's heading north and somebody else is coming south, they're at an odd 1,000 plus 500 and you're at an even 1,000 plus 500. You now have 1,000 feet of clearance between you and that's guaranteed you're not going to hit each other. Because uh, as a VFR pilot, you are responsible for your collision avoidance. You need to be looking outside for other traffic. And there will be times when you might be doing a maneuver and all of a sudden you're just messing around. You do your clearing turns and you look down there's a plane flying right past you. Um, so those are the VFR cruising altitudes. So when you plan across country, you go here to St. Cloud or you go here to New Ulm, you will look and see, okay, my course to St. Cloud is 347, therefore I must be on an even 1,000 plus 500. And then for instrument pilots, they use the opposite of this. That way there's no, no mix-up. Uh, 91167 gets into fuel requirements for IFR. That doesn't apply. VOR, yeah, 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 IFR, IFR. Uh, 91.203, uh, this talks about equipment, instrument, and certificate requirements. 
Uh, this has to do with what needs to be in the airplane for you to go fly. And this is aero. So, in the airplane, you need an airworthiness certificate. These always must be visible to everybody in the airplane. We usually put them on the side of uh, like the back pillar where the door is or on the very back where the baggage area is. Uh, this states that the FAA has looked at the airplane and certified this airplane is certified to fly. It's airworthy. Um, this is registration. Registration. You have a federal and state registration for your airplane. And this would be registration state, registration federal. They did make it, if you fly to Canada, you need a radio uh, operator's permit. Doesn't really apply if you're not doing it. Uh, the O is gonna be POH, Pilot's Operating Handbook, kind of like your car owner's manual. It has everything in it. It has V-speed systems, how much fuel your plane holds, uh, anything you would need to know. And the last one is weight and balance. You need to know how much your airplane weighs right now with the equipment that's in it. If they take out a radio and put a new radio in, they must make a change of that weight change so you know because it's illegal to fly overweight and the plane might not perform if it's overweight so you need to know exactly how much the plane weighs. Uh, and we'll jump over here. Doc documents required on you when you go fly is a medical certificate, uh, which would also be your student pilot certificate if you're uh, a student. A photo ID, so you need to have a driver's license uh, or a passport, something to show that uh, you have a photo ID. And your certificate. Once you have your certificate, right now you have your student pilot certificate. Those are the three things that must always be on you. Then we get into 91205. And this is what you need to know to stay alive. Uh, there's something called a minimum equipment list. I'm not going to get crazy into this. Uh, you will get asked this on your check ride. Do we have a minimum equipment list for this airplane? Uh, the answer is no, we do not have a minimum equipment list. We follow 91205. Uh, this has to do with airworthiness uh, instruments and equipment requirements. What needs to be installed on the airplane, in the airplane, uh, to be legally airworthy? Uh, you'll get asked this by a check ride examiner. You know, do we have an MEL? You just always say no, we follow this. So, under 91205, it goes through all of the required equipments for VFR flying. So, who wants to tell me what they are? You've all got them. Start with the T. Tack. We need a tachometer. We need to know how fast the engine RPM is going. Oil pressure. Oil pressure. We need to know if we have oil pressure. That's important. Nope. We're going to have to have a mixture, otherwise we're not going to leave the ground. M. M, 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 M. This is going to be a manifold pressure gauge. Uh, that's for a complex airplane. You're operating with a little different engine with a controllable pitch propeller. You're probably going to have manifold pressure. Uh, how about the A? Altimeter. Altimeter. We need to know how high we are off the ground. It's pretty hard to judge. You might think you're 2,000 feet and you might only be 1,000. T is temp gauge. This is for liquid-cooled engines. Are, are our engines air-cooled or liquid-cooled? Air. Air-cooled. So we do not have temp gauges because we don't have liquid cooling going through our, our engines. That's why the cowling has a big opening in the front. Oh, another oil. Temp. Oil temp. We've got to know how hot the airplane is. If we have low oil pressure and high oil temp, what does that mean? What's going on? Too lean. Too lean on fuel? Or low on fuel or low on oil? Low on oil. 
so you might be low on oil. Um, a big thing with that too is if you ever encounter something like that where uh, a gauge says, you know, your oil pressure is way down but your oil temp's staying fine, it's probably either a gauge issue um, or it might just be that uh, it's kind of a fluke thing. Uh, when you're flying, a lot of these airplanes are not 2015 airplanes, a lot of them are very old, they're 70s, 80s. Uh, sometimes things do not always work correctly. So use your best judgment when something happens and don't freak out right away and declare an emergency because all of a sudden your oil pressure dropped to the bottom of the green arc. Uh, kind of use your brain and go, okay, my oil pressure is really low, but my oil temp is still stable. It's probably a gauge issue. Uh, I'll check it out when we get back and land as soon as possible. All right, we still got more. F, this is important, this is very important. Fuel gauge. Fuel gauge. Believe it or not, a majority of the accidents that are caused in aviation are people running out of fuel. It's the number one cause. Uh, they do not check their tanks before they go. They don't do a thorough pre-flight. They jump in the plane. They think they have full tanks. They only have half tanks and they don't make it to the destination. L. This one is landing gear position lights. This is for if you have a plane with retractable gear. You need to know if the gear comes down all the way. There's three, three gear. You need to make sure each one has a green light and shows that it is retracted and down. Uh, how about A? Airspeed. Airspeed. I don't know how fast we're going. M. How are we going to know where we're going? Magnetic compass. Yep. Back in the old days, this was the only way to do it. My compass, E. E, 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 E. E, L, T. Emergency locator transmitter. Uh, they have this new technology that came out a while back called 406 ELTs. They uh, are very accurate and have a better range on them for pinpointing accuracy of where your aircraft is at. Every airplane must have one of these. If you don't have a fancy 406 ELT, you have an impact activated ELT that goes off and sends a distress signal to somebody flying over if they're monitoring uh, 121.5. And S, this is important. You're going to want this if you get into an accident. Seatbelts! Seat I don't know about you, but I would like to have those. So that is 91205. Um, and then there's 91205 that goes to the night section. So for night, this is day, this is everything you need for the day. Uh, for the night, it's going to be fuses. Three of each kind. Uh, and for a long time, I've kind of pondered this in my head and go, well, we must have spare fuses in the plane and have three of each kind, but I could never find them. They were never there. They weren't in the glove box. They weren't anywhere in the plane. That means three of each kind in the panel where the fuses are located. Uh, you need to have three matching. So if they're 20 amp fuses, you need to have three of them in there. That way you can mix and match. Uh, L, what would L be? How are you gonna see the runway when you come down? Landing lights, but believe it or not, this is only if you are for hire. You do not need a landing light if you are not for hire, and for hire being a flight school like us or a commercial operator. If you have your own airplane, you do not need a landing night, uh, light to land at night. Uh, it's very fun when you turn off your landing light and try to land at night, it doesn't. We'll do it once on your training just so you can see what it's like, but it's very hard to see. Uh, what would the A be? How are people gonna see you at night? How about some anti-collision lights? What would be an example of an anti-collision light? Markers yeah, the beacon, so the flashing red beacon. Uh, or strobe lights, strobe lights would be. After 96, 
Uh, it is required for all airplanes to have a beacon. Uh, prior to it is not. Uh, but you must have anti-collision lights to fly at night. So if you had strobe lights before 96, you didn't need a beacon. So if your beacon was out and you wanted to go flying, you had strobes, you could still do it. Uh, P, how are you going to know which way an airplane's passing you as you fly? Position lights. Position lights. So here comes the million dollar question. If there's a green light going by, what does that mean? We're flying south and all of a sudden a green light comes flying past us. Which way is the airplane going? Which wing am I looking at? The right one? So the right side is green, the left side is red. That way you know if the airplane is flying which way it's facing. Uh, and then what if you can only see the beacon? You're flying along and you see a beacon, a flashing beacon, but you don't see anything else. What does that mean? Behind it. Mm, if you're behind it, you'd have a white light to show that the position of it, so it'd be going away for you, from you. So what if it's just a flashing beacon? You're flying and you just see a flashing beacon. It's coming at you. <laughs> so you probably want to turn. Which way are we going to turn? <coughs> to the right. To the right. It's like that Beyonce song, but the other way. <laughs> Uh, you see both red and green? You do not see the side side lights. Uh, they're much harder to see. You can only see them when they're coming on the side of you. Uh, and then what about S? How are we going to run all of these? Source of power. We need some way to turn all of these on. So a source of power being a battery, alternator type of thing. So let me ask you this. You go to pre-flight your airplane and uh, you have a lesson and you go and you put the flaps down and the flaps don't come down. Can you still go flying? I don't think so. I don't think so. Is it on here? No, it's not required. You don't need it. Flaps are a secondary control surface. So, if you go out to the airplane and the flaps don't come down, you can still go flying. Is it wise? It depends on your opinion. Uh, but you must do something in order to legally go take it. You must disconnect and placard an operative for that device. So you need to pull a circuit breaker for the flaps. You need to actually go in and pull some wires from the back and have a mechanic or somebody verify uh, that they're capped off and then uh, you need to actually take we use like the little label makers and we put in op flaps in op or something of that nature that way whoever's flying it next knows that there's a problem that uh, they're not going to have their flaps what if we go out and uh, the beacon doesn't turn on when we turn the beacon on we turn the beacon on we turn the landing light on we turn the nav lights on none of the lights come on and we want to go flying can you go and we're flying at 1 in the afternoon. No? Why not? Can we go? Yeah. None of the lights work? No lights? What if we don't even have a radio? Yeah. Still go. You don't need it. It's not on here. So use that in your mind when you're kind of pre-flighting. And when you are pre-flighting, if you do see something that uh, doesn't look right to you, or you're unsure of, make sure you ask somebody. Nobody is going to chide you for asking a question as silly as it may be. Uh, and if they do, we would love to talk to them about it. Um, how about at night? We want to go fly at night and uh, our altimeter is stuck. Can we still go flying? Nope. Nope, because that's required. We need all of this and that. Uh, so you kind of get the idea. Uh, if that happens here, since we're the flight school, we're responsible for the maintenance of the airplane, uh, we will take care of it and we would placard something and mark it in op. And uh, depending if it's needed or not, uh, would dictate how your flight's going to go. Uh, these airplanes fly a lot. Uh, all airplanes are beasts of their own and have miscellaneous gremlins and interesting things that occur at random points. Uh, 
So use kind of your best judgment for what's going on. Any questions with that? What do we have to do if something's not working? That's not required. Go see ya. <laughs> Disconnect it and placard it in op. And then what if one of these isn't working? What can't we do? Fly. Yeah, we can't fly. Yeah. Can't fly, period. It's down until it gets fixed. <clears throat> So they don't require a radio? Mm -mm. There's guys flying out at Air Lake, just south of here, and they have no radio. Don't need it. There's no tower. And then you got to watch out for them as you're flying around in the pattern. Uh, supplemental oxygen, 91 to 11. Uh, you'll get asked this on your check ride, too. Uh, at cabin pressure altitudes above 12,500 feet up to 14,000 feet unless the required minimum flight crew is provided with and uses supplemental oxygen for that part of the flight at those altitudes that is of more than 30 minutes of duration. At cabin pressure altitudes above 14,000 feet unless the required minimum flight crew is provided with and uses supplemental oxygen during the entire flight time at those altitudes. And at cabin pressure altitudes above 15,000 feet, each occupant of the aircraft is provided with supplemental oxygen. So above 12,500 but below 14,000 for more than 30 minutes, the pilot needs to have oxygen. Uh, there are airplanes that can go up there uh, that are single engine land. Uh, between 14 and 15, the crew, if it's a two-person crew and they're required to be there, they both have to use oxygen, and above 15, everybody needs it. Uh, then it gets into pressurized aircraft that doesn't apply. Uh, 91213 is, talks about inoperative instruments and equipment. This goes into the minimum equipment list. Uh, and here it gives the definition. The aircraft has within it a letter of authorization issued by the FAA Flight Standards District Office having jurisdiction over the area in which the operator is located authorizing operation of the aircraft under the minimum equipment list. The letter of authorization may be obtained by a written request of the airworthiness certificate holder. The minimum equipment list and the letter of authorization constitute a supplemental type certificate, certificate of the aircraft. So essentially, the FAA comes out with and under like airline operations, which is part 121, or charter operations under 135, uh, we have a minimum equipment list. We have a big book that says of all the things that need to be operative. Uh, Believe it or not, there's airliners flying around there right now that have like a ton of items on their, uh, not on their minimum equipment list, but things that aren't working right now or are inoperative. And uh, they don't fall under the minimum equipment list so they can still fly. Uh, and like the King Air 200, it says if the, uh, if the blower system for the ventilation system is out, you cannot fly the airplane. Uh, and then for something else, it might say like, if this circuit breaker is popped, you can still fly, but you need to do this and this and this, and they have required times to be inspected by. So most, more than likely, minimum equipment lists are going to be for part 135 and part 121. For us, we do not care. We do not have one. It's a trick question. Uh, 91, 215, ATC, transponder and altitude reporting equipment. If you have a transponder, you should use it. Uh, what do we need to fly into Class B airspace with our transponder? It needs to have a special, special something with it. Mode C. We're under the Mode C veil, the purple ring. That allows them to see altitude and heading. Helps them out a lot. Uh, We'll go back here really quick and we'll talk about uh, required maintenance inspections for these airplanes. Uh, the acronym, and you notice there's a lot of acronyms, the easiest one. Uh, these are going to be required inspections. The first one is going to be a annual inspection. This is every 12 calendar months. So every 12 months, the airplane must undergo an annual inspection. An annual inspection is a very thorough inspection. The seats come out, the carpet comes out, all the wing inspection panels get popped, the engine gets compression tested. Uh, it's a full walk around. On our 172, it's a 17-hour inspection for an annual by a mechanic. Uh, it's very, very labor intensive, it's expensive, and if you own an airplane every 12 months you got to do it. Even if you only fly one hour, it has to go through an annual again. Um, 
The next one, this completes the acronym. This one is not required for what we're doing, uh, but it makes it say AV8, so it's cool. Uh, it's a VOR every 30 days. This is for IFR, uh, instruments, instrument flying. You need to make sure your VOR is checked every 30 days. Um, so not required. <coughs> the I is 100 hour inspection. So the 100 hour inspection is required by commercial operators, not by airlines. They have their own progressive maintenance plan that they can fly certain amounts of hours and replace things in an interval. Uh, for skydiving companies, banner towing, uh, anything that does uh, some kind of commercial operation like flight instructing, we need to do 100 hour inspections. So every 100 hours or close to 100 hours, uh, we pull the airplane down and we give it a 100 hour inspection. The 100 hour inspection is no different than an annual. It's the same exact inspection, they just call it a 100 hour inspection. We sign all of our 100 hours off as annuals because we do an annual every single 100 hours. So every 100 hours the airplane's getting a 17 hour inspection and anything that uh, is starting to fail or uh, has failed that's not required to be there gets replaced. There is a key uh, catch with this. A A&P, Airplane and Power Plant Mechanic, can do a 100 hour inspection. They cannot do an annual inspection unless they have what's called an IA, Inspector's Authorization. Um, the IA comes usually after a certain amount of years working as an A&P. Uh, and so a trick question on your check ride is gonna be, what's the difference between an annual and a 100 hour? There is no difference. It's the same, same exact inspection, except the annual needs to be signed off by somebody with an inspections authorization, IA. And that means they've gone through and taken an extra written test and have the authority to sign off the annual. So what's the difference between the 100 hour and the annual? Nothing, same inspection. If you own an airplane, you do not have to do 100 hour. You could fly 800 hours a year and you do not have to do 100 hour. If I own an airplane, I would probably, every 100 hours, probably get it checked out just for peace of mind. Uh, a, what do you think the A is going to be? Altimeter. And that's going to be every 24 months. So the altimeter pedostatic system gets checked every 24 months. They run the altimeter up to 20,000 feet and they check it to make sure it's accurate with the system as they pressurize air into the pedo tube. Uh, to make sure it's reading correctly. T is transponder. And that is every 24 calendar months. They check and make sure it's functioning right and that it's showing correct altitude. Uh, and E, the last one's E. ELT. And that is going to be every 12 months or half battery life. Some of the ELTs are connected to the airplane. They're hardwired in uh, and they're checked every 12 months. Usually they're just done at every annual. We check ours at every annual. If they are battery powered, they have these massive like D cell batteries in them and they are checked every uh, half battery life if you have them on. Uh, at the top of the hour, uh, every hour, you may test your ELT. Uh, if your ELT is on and somebody catches note of it, you are probably going to get a phone call from U.S. Search and Rescue. And after that, they'll probably send somebody out to find where the signal is coming from. Uh, I had a guy uh, accidentally turn one on in our airplane. He was in Eau Claire, like getting lunch with his mom or something. And I get a call from the U.S. Search and Rescue. Hey, your ELT is going off. Uh, you know, is your airplane okay? And, well, I don't know. So I had to call the guy and make sure. And like three months ago, there was one, uh, one in a hangar. Somebody bumped it in the hangar and the ELT was going off for like six hours and they had to send somebody out to the hangar and it was not, not good. Um, so when you test the ELT at the top of the hour, you turn your ELT on and you go to 121.5 on your radio. That is the emergency frequency. Uh, a lot of airline pilots monitor 121.5 on a secondary radio since they're flying by and they can hear. Uh, when you're in flatland like this, if you're 10 miles away from the airport, you're probably gonna be able to radio into the tower and say, hey, I have a problem. Uh, but if you're in the mountains or something, you really wanna activate this uh, so that people can find you. 
Uh, there's actually a watch, uh, a Breitling watch, and it has an ELT b built into it. It's like eight grand. Uh, but you can pull the pin on the ELT and it'll actually go off for like 24 hours or something. And their claim uh, is that if you have to pull the pin, they'll replace the watch for free. Uh, <laughs> so if they find you. Uh, <laughs> a lot of ifs there. Yeah, yeah. But with that new 406 ELT technology, it's a lot more GPS based and they can pinpoint you closer. Uh, with that ELT test, you get five minutes after the top of the hour. If you do it after that, the tower starts hearing it because they're monitoring it and then they're going to ask you, hey, I think your ELT's on. Any questions about that? Is everybody going to remember all this? How many days do you have to change your address? Three, Three days. Uh, there's this new thing that's coming out, uh, 91227. It's called ADSB, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast Out Equipment Performance Requirements. Uh, by 2020, 2020, there is this new technology called ADSB that needs to be in every airplane that will uh, essentially allow every airplane that's out flying. Uh, to provide better traffic uh, alerts for ATC and for other pilots. Uh, if you are familiar with Sporty's Pilot Shop, they sell a device called a Stratus. It's a little box and it goes in the airplane and actually sends ADSB to your iPad and you can like link off of other people's ADSB and you can see live traffic on your iPad of people flying around. It's pretty cool. It provides weather and some other stuff, but that's just something new in here. Uh, 91303 aerobatic flight. Some of you might be into this. Uh, no person may operate an aircraft in aerobatic flight over any congested area of a city, town, or settlement over an open air assembly of persons within the lateral boundaries of the surface areas of class B, class C, class D, or class E airspace designated for an airport within four nautical miles of the center line of any federal airway and below an altitude of 1,500 feet above the surface or when flight visibility is less than three statute miles. Um, 91307 parachutes uh, that talks about uh, that talks about uh, wearing parachutes for aerobatic flight. Uh, you have about the requirements for having to pack them, uh, and you must wear a parachute if you have a bank of 60 degrees relative to the horizon, nose up or down, pitch attitude of 30 degrees, etc. Uh, what else do we got? This is an interesting one that doesn't really have a lot of say, but 91321, carriage of candidates and elections. As an aircraft operator, you may receive payment for carrying a candidate, a candidate agent, or a candidate, agent of a candidate, <laughs> or a person traveling on behalf of a candidate running for federal, state, or local election without having to comply with the rules in parts of 121, 125, or 135. Uh, and then it gives you a bunch of conditions. Um, so you can actually carry a candidate and they can pay you for the flight if, uh, if you so choose. Uh, and then there's actually another one that's kind of interesting. 91323 talks about increased maximum certificated weights for certain airplanes operated in Alaska. Uh, it's illegal to fly overweight, but in Alaska, uh, if you're under 12,500 pounds and they specify your airplane can do it, you can fly at 115% of the maximum weight listed in the aircraft specs. Only in Alaska. Only in Alaska, probably because they got a lot of pop and bread and mail to haul. Uh, Ninety-one four zero seven operation after maintenance, preventative maintenance, rebuilding, or alteration. Uh, no person may operate an aircraft that has undergone maintenance, preventive maintenance, rebuilding, or alteration unless it has been returned to service by a person authorized under 43.7 of this chapter. And it goes through. Uh, the big one is in here that after a major alteration, uh, new engine, major work that's been done, uh, you do not want to take somebody with you. Why would that be? 
because they might come with you. Uh, there's actually a girl that uh, was flying with us back in 2010, I believe it was. Uh, really nice, nice girl. Uh, she was a part of this air race team they had going on here in a Mooney, and uh, she loved to fly. She had a little, I think it was a son, and uh, any chance she gets, she go flying. Well, there was some guy who had a Beach 18 uh, somewhere around here. And he'd just gotten done like doing a bunch of work to it. She offered to go along with him. He accepted, they took off, and he had some mechanical issues and put it into the house right over here. You might have seen it on the news a while back. Uh, so that's why they say don't do that, uh, because you can take somebody with you and they want you to take yourself instead. Uh, so that is part 91. Not too bad. Uh, then it goes through, it talks about 135 and all this other stuff. Then the second half of the book is the AIM. Um, actually, we got another thing to talk about. We got to talk about NTSB 830 first. Um, here's another acronym for you. Uh, this is a quick one. It is P Faction, F A C T I O N, P Faction. And this is NTSB notification. And actually, what I'll do is I'll just erase this. These are when you need to notify the NTSB of a certain condition. So we have P is going to be property damage over $25,000. If you crash straight into somebody's house, there's probably a good chance it's going to be over 25 grand. Uh, F is going to be fire in flight. No relation to us. Uh, a is going to be an accident. C is going to be a collision in flight. Uh, T is going to be turbine failure. And do we have turbine airplanes? No, I wish. Uh, I is going to be illness of a required crew member. Uh, o is going to be overdue aircraft. And N is going to be no control, some kind of control failure. Those are when you need to immediately notify the NTSB. The NTSB is in with the FAA. They are buddies. NTSB is responsible for all accident investigations, and the FAA assists. Um, so this is where we get into definitions of uh, what this is. <clears throat> and I'll let you interpret these. Uh, an aircraft accident means an occurrence associated with the operation of an aircraft which takes place between the time any person boards the aircraft with the intention of flight and all such persons have disembarked, and in which any person suffers death or serious injury, or in which the aircraft receives substantial damage. For purposes of this part, the definition of aircraft accident includes unmanned aircraft accident as defined herein. So what's an aircraft accident? Accident injury from the time they boarded, the time they... Yep, death, serious injury, substantial damage is the key. Uh, if you touch down and you flip the airplane over and the wings get bent, that's substantial damage, that's an accident. Uh, fatal injury means any injury which results in death within 30 days of the accident. So that's how they determine if an accident is fatal or not. If somebody dies day 31, it's not a fatal accident anymore. <clears throat> C 
serious injury means any injury which requires hospitalization for more than 48 hours, commencing within seven days from the date the injury was received. Results in a fracture of any bone, except simple fractures of fingers, toes, or nose. Causes severe hemorrhages, nerve muscle, or tendon damage. Involves any internal organ or involves second or third degree burns or any burns affecting more than 5% of the body surface. That's serious injury. That's how they define it. Substantial damage means damage or failure which adversely affects the structural strength, performance, or flight characteristics of the aircraft and which would normally require major repair or replacement of the affected component. Engine failure or damage limited to an engine if only one engine fails or is damaged bent fairings or cowling, dented skin, small punctured holes in the skin or fabric, ground damage to rotor or propeller blades and damage to landing gear, wheels, tires, flaps, engine accessories, brakes, or wingtips are not considered substantial damage for the purpose of this part. So if you have a propeller strike and you hit the propeller on the ground and the engine stays running and you taxi off, it's not considered an accident because there wasn't substantial damage even though you just bent the propeller. Um, 830.5 has to do with that P-faction acronym. That's immediate notification when you have to notify. Um, Let's see here. Anything that uh, is not an accident is considered an incident. It's very vague. Uh, let's see. So that is NTSB 830. A uh, couple things in the far aim. Uh, in the back of the AIM, uh, in the 2015 version, it's on page 587, it's 2-1-7. Uh, the AIM is the Airman's Information Manual. This is everything that you would ever want to know. How to do radio calls, how to check the weather. Uh, in here it has uh, runway entrance light signs, airport lighting, taxiway stuff. Uh, you can see all the different markings. It's a really good resource if you ever cannot sleep at night and you have one of these, it will put you to sleep very fast, especially the first half that we just went through. Uh, so go through the AIM, it's honestly like full of really good information. There's airspace charts in here, so you got like all your airspace. Uh, kind of the same thing that was in before in 91. Uh, let's see. Believe it or not, there are some flight instructors who have read through the FAR AIM like 10 times. And then if we jump ahead in the AIM under, this is a key, key one, 7-1-31, it's on page 926 of the 2015 FAR AIM. Uh, there is a table that has a lot of the weather identifiers in it. Uh, and they're all right here. Uh, when you start getting into weather and you start looking at METARs and TAFs and how to decode weather, the weather, the way it's uh, put out, is very abbreviated. And so, unless you have looked at these, you're not going to have a clue that FZ means freezing. I mean, you can use your common sense, but uh, they describe uh, hail as GR. GR means hail. It's hailing when you see the words GR. Uh, SG, snow grains. Uh, mist is BR, baby rain. It's the only way we remember it. Baby rain, mist. Uh, sand is SA. FU is smoke. Uh, VA is volcanic ash. Uh, SS is sandstorm. So it helps when you're decoding these METARs to have an understanding of what some of these uh, descriptors mean. And then it gets into a whole section in the back of that that keeps going about decoding these. Probably the hardest thing you'll do as a pilot is decode weather. Uh, takes a little while getting used to because it's not in normal English. Uh, hypoxia you'll talk about later. Any of the radio stuff uh, that you're curious about is in here. And then there's actually a pilot and controller glossary in the back. And this goes through and has every kind of word you would see 
talk, talk, spoken to by a controller. Uh, you know, what does clear for approach mean? What does course mean? What does uh, expedite mean in their definition? What does go around mean? Uh, what is an obstacle? Uh, and then when you get in the very back, this is where you have your glossary to look everything up. So you can say, I want to learn more about uh, drug offenses. And then it tells you, oh, that's 6115 in the FAR, it's on page 44. So anything, this is like the holy grail of aviation. This is where everything is. Uh, if you're ever, ever unsure of something, you look in here to find it. Uh, and if you're still unsure, then you call the FAA. Uh, and then they tell you their best interpretation, although sometimes their inspectors all have different opinions on a certain item, depending on what it is. Uh, any questions?